He preceded his ambassadorial position with work in the political sector. In January 1986, Mr. Nicholson was elected committee man for the Colorado for the Republican National Committee, RNC. In 1993, he was elected vice chairman of the RNC. And in January 1997, he was elected chairman of the RNC, where he served for four years through the elections of 2000. He is a 1961 graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. He served eight years on active duty as paratrooper and range, ranger qualified army officer, then 22 years in the Army Reserve, retiring with the rank of colonel. While serving in Vietnam, he earned the Bronze Star Medal, Combat Infantryman Badge, the Mauritius Service Medal, and uh, Republic of Vietnam Cross of Gallantry and two Air Medals. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Secretary Jim Nicholson, who's going to speak about enhanced human dignity, the US diplomatic mandate. Thank you. Good day, everyone. It's, uh, am I uh, what's between you and lunch? Is it, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, come over and be with you and discuss this subject. It's an interesting time uh, for those of you from outside of Washington to, uh, to be here on a day like this, a historic uh, decision of the Supreme Court having been announced, and a probably very historic vote to be taken by the U.S. House today on whether or not to uh, hold the U.S. Attorney General uh, in contempt of the Congress. Uh, so it, it's always kind of an interesting time to be in Washington. I'm from Denver, Colorado, and I have a good friend out there, wealthy oil man. He said he, he only comes to Washington to visit his money. And, uh, and today there's really not enough of that to go around either. But uh, I came to talk to you about uh, about the, the mandate of American uh, foreign policy and, and, and how we implemented this in, in one uh, small, I think, but uh, strategically important diplomatic mission. It may be, be helpful uh, to give a little bit more about my background. You've heard that I was chairman of the Republican National Committee for four years, and we did win the election in 2000. Uh, it took us 35 additional days to know for sure whether we had won or not, uh, but we did, and uh, Vice President-elect Cheney asked me if I would uh, be, be interested in being Secretary of the Army, and I said I didn't think so in spite of my Army background. Uh, so then uh, President-elect Bush asked me what I would like to do, and I said I'd like to serve you as an ambassador, and he immediately said, I was hoping you'd say that I'd like you to go to Australia. But my wife's parents are both alive and uh, too elderly for us to go halfway around the globe. So I think my facial expression showed that. So he said, well, where do you want to go? And I said, I'd like to go to the Vatican and to the Holy See in Rome. And typical George W. Bush fashion, he said, the Vatican? <laughs> I said, yes, the Vatican. And I think he had somebody teed up for it. So he said, I have to get back to you. And the next day he called me and said, would you still like to go to the Vatican? And I said, I would. And he said, well, I would like you to go to the Vatican. And uh, so I, I, I did, of course, after uh, several months of, of preparation. And uh, I got there at an interesting time. A few days before, uh, I presented my credentials to the head of state, the sovereign head of, the, of that state, the Holy See. And I made my rounds, and there was a cocktail party one night in Rome, and uh, got into a quite a protracted conversation with an archbishop who's on the staff of the Vatican. And, and uh, I said, as we were about to break up, I said, by the way, Your Excellency, I said, what, what do you do here at the Holy See? And he looked at me with a smirk, and he said, well, actually, Ambassador, he said, I make saints. And <laughs> so I said, well, how can I get on your good side? And he said, he said, well, you could start with a miracle. And I said, well, I, you know, I just uh, came from being the head of the Republican Party and we elected George Bush president. There are some people who think I did uh, perform a miracle. <laughs> but uh, we, we moved on and uh, 
to uh, 913 of 01 was the day I presented my credentials to the Holy Father of his summer, summer palace in Castel Gandolfo. And it was 48 hours after the events of uh, New York and Washington and Pennsylvania. And of course, we were both very despondent. And the Holy Father, uh, I mean, first thing he did, he said, would you like to say a prayer with me for the victims? And I said, I would indeed. And then we threw our prepared remarks out and he said, you know, Ambassador, he said, we have to stop these people around the world who are killing in the name of God. And that was not a privileged communication, so we put that out there. And it actually helped us in developing our coalition then to go into Afghanistan and root out the base of the Al-Qaeda who had perpetrated this horrific uh, crime against uh, over 3,000 of our fellow Americans. But uh, often people ask me, as did President Bush, who came over there three times while I was there to see the Pope, said, why did you want to go to the Vatican? And uh, it's an interesting thing, I think, given you know my background. But I, I had read a book, which I'm sure many of you have read. It was uh, written by Henry Kissinger in the, in the late 1990s. And it was, the title of it is, Should America Have a Foreign Policy? And it's a tome. It's a typical Kissinger tome. But at the, the end of it, the last paragraph of the book says this, and I'm going to read it to you. And it really caught my attention. It struck me as I finished the book. It says, America's ultimate challenge is to transform its power into moral consensus, promoting its values not by the imposition of power, but by their willing acceptance in a world that, for all its seeming resistance, desperately needs enlightened leadership. And uh, I, I, I got to know Henry Kissinger. Uh, he was, uh, he loved, by the way, campaigning. When I was chairman of the party, I used to ask him to go out and highlight political events, and he, he just loved it. So he used to call me sometimes from New York, and he'd say, hey, chairman, what else have you got for me, you know, to go out? And so I would send him out, and of course the people loved him. But I, I talked to him about that, and he said, I should, have, uh, I should have said more about that. He said, it's absolutely right. I should have been more expansive. And then uh, later, uh, when I talked to him after 9-11, uh, because I used to see him every, every six or eight weeks, he came to Rome because he was uh, advising the, uh, the Gianelli family in Italy. And uh, he said, the people who bought that book from me should have gotten their money back. He said, because I did not mention terrorism in that book. But he, he did make that conclusion, as I've just, uh, I've just recited to you, about, uh, about the importance of, of, of making the moral case, the moral leadership of a power, uh, albeit a, a superpower temporally or a, whatever uh, one country is. And again, uh, that, that kind of gripped me, uh, because I, I knew a little bit about the Holy See. I'm a lifelong Catholic. and. Uh, so in spite of that background of being an a army ranger and a soldier and a Vietnam veteran and businessman and a lawyer and a political rough and tumble and so forth, I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to experience that with that admonition in mind, which heightened my interest, of course, in going uh, to the Holy See. And here we have now the confluence of, of really America, the world's greatest temporal superpower, the United States aligned with probably the world's greatest uh, spiritual superpower. We're a continent virtually. There are 106 acres. But they're in communion with 1.4 billion Catholics. And uh, as I read and learned more and more, there's a, quite a great alignment uh, of our values. And what it really boiled down to uh, in the uh, preparation and briefings I got from state, mostly, some at the Meridian Institute, it surfaced uh, in my awareness that the real preamble to our purposes of foreign policy in the United States is to enhance human dignity. And that's a surprise to a lot of people. That's a surprise to a lot of diplomats. It's certainly a surprise to a lot of people in the military, but it indeed is the case. And it's historically True, and it's not to enhance human dignity in Virginia or Colorado. It's to enhance human dignity writ large, worldwide. And 
I, uh, if, if I wrote a book in 2004 about the relationship between the United States and the Holy See. But in, in, I, a quote I had in that book, which I'll also recite for you, says, the national security strategy of the United States states clearly that the first goal of American international engagement is to stand firmly for the non-negotiable demands of human dignity, the rule of law, limits on the absolute power of the state. The interesting uh, recital in today's atmosphere of the court decision. The rule of law, the freedom of worship, equal justice, respect for women, religious and ethnic tolerance, and respect for private property. That, that uh, it defines uh, what the United States and its, its, its emphasis on human dignity stands for. So if you then think of bringing that together again in the, in the confines of this diplomatic mission, which I headed up with a, a country, by the way, with whom we've had diplomatic contact since 1788. That was when Pius VI wrote a letter to President George Washington asking him uh, if he, the Pope, could appoint a bishop in this new republic, the United States. And it was conveyed overland to Paris, where Benjamin Franklin was the ambassador, and then come to Washington. And Washington, George Washington found it a curious request and replied back, tell uh, the Holy Father, of course he can appoint a bishop. Uh, that's what the revolution was about, was freedom. And it certainly included religious freedom. So uh, rather forthrightly, uh, the Pope appointed a bishop here in the United States, who's a Jesuit named John Carroll. And uh, Carroll's a founder, by the way, of, uh, George, of Georgetown University. And he was the first bishop uh, ever uh, in this country. And, uh, but uh, that was the beginning of diplomatic contact, but we never, never were able to, to realize full diplomatic relations until 1984, when Ronald Reagan uh, was president of the United States and uh, was working closely with the Pope, John Paul II, and Margaret Thatcher, and their entreaties in, in Poland in, in trying to, uh, to do what they eventually did in bringing down uh, the Soviet Union. And the Pope uh, used to send a general over there by the name of Vernon Walters, who I got to know quite well, because he, he spoke perfect Polish, and he used to brief the Pope with rolls of satellite photography under his arm and lay it out and brief him on the order of battle of the Soviets as they were continuing to move intermediate range nuclear tip missiles further and further westward into West Central Europe. And uh, when Carter was the president, the Europeans had asked for an antidote to that, which was a missile that could shoot them down, and the United States and its technology developed that. By the time Reagan became the president, they decided they didn't really want it because they didn't want further to provoke the Soviets. And it was, uh, it was the result of these briefings of General Walters and the Pope's awareness of the Soviet uh, regime, if you will, having lived under it in Poland. And he said to, the, to President Reagan, he said, bring those missiles, uh, those anti-missiles in, as did Margaret Thatcher. And so the Pope, uh, then said to General Walters and, and to George Schultz, who was Secretary of State, and he said, uh, in his own way of speaking, he said, we really need that fella over there at the, in Rome, and we should have uh, full diplomatic relations. So he was able to get that through the Congress. No one else had ever been able to do that. And that happened in 1984. So I was only the sixth ambassador. So finally arriving over there and presenting my credentials and uh, thinking about what, what uh, you know, I wanted to do uh, in this unique mission where I had no responsibilities for military basing, uh, current trade accounts, current accounts, uh, I, and being a, a, a so-called political appointee who knew the president well, I had a certain amount of freedom that, that career diplomats uh, don't have, really. I mean, two-thirds of our ambassadors in this country are professional diplomatic officers. And, and usually about one-third uh, are executive appointments. Uh, people come out of some other career for a while to go and be an ambassador such as me. 
So with the help of my good little staff over there, very bright people, we came up with five things that we thought were constituencies of a life of dignity. That were, that were contemporaneous issues. Uh, one was food uh, and, uh, and starvation. Because every day in Africa, 25 million people were dying from malnutrition and or starvation. And they didn't have to be because there is technology out there that is sufficient to feed Africa and uh, it's a controversial issue. It's called genetically modified organisms. But we have about 310 million Americans who eat that kind of food three times a day. There's never been a reported case of the hiccups, yet GMOs are very controversial, particularly in Europe. And it's, it's controversial because of the niche that the Europeans, including the Italians, have in, in the food industry, and they've been able quite successfully to hold it off politically. And uh, I spent a great deal of my political uh, diplomatic currency on this, trying to get the Vatican to leave because it was a moral issue. And I used to say to them right in their face, I'd say, you know, someone who dies of starvation is every bit as dead as someone who dies from an abortion. And you don't equivocate on abortion. How can you equivocate on this food issue, which, which uh, they did for far too long? Another that we spent a great amount of time on was HIV AIDS, particularly in Africa. We did a test in Mozambique, 5,000 pregnant women. They took the antiretroviral regimes in a disciplined way, and we kept, the, uh, we kept the, the virus of the disease from transforming from the mother to the baby through gestation and nursing. And it, so it, it absolutely works if it's done in a prescribed way, and we proved that. Another is religious freedom. You can't live a life of dignity if you can't uh, freely express yourself and how you feel about a religion or uh, the right to not uh, feel or manifest a feeling about religion. That, that's, that's a freedom as well. And I remember one day the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia came to the Vatican to visit the Pope, and we'd help brief uh, on that, and we wanted him to discuss reciprocity, which is that doctrine of where if you allow people to practice their religion in your sovereignty, you will allow them to do it in yours. And Saudi Arabia does not do that. There are over a million Christians living in Saudi Arabia, m many of them Filipinos, who cannot not practice their religion. They can't show any signs of it, no indices of a, of a cross or crucifix of any kind. So the Pope uh, brought this up with the Crown Prince, and the Crown Prince was expecting it, and he said to the Holy Father, he said, you know, he said, driving in here to the Vatican today, he said, I did not see one mosque or one minaret, not one. And the Holy Father came right back on him, and he said, you know, Your Highness, he said, if we had any Muslims here, you would have. And, uh, and they would have. I mean, that's how reciprocity works. The fourth of the, of the five constituents was international terrorism. That uh, was an obvious thing, uh, the threatening people as it still does today. And then the, f the fifth was uh, trafficking in persons. And I had been briefed on this uh, extensively before going off to post. And I'll have to admit to you that there again, I was, I was totally unaware of the enormity, uh, and the, 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 the cruelty, the, the deprivation of being wreaked on people uh, in the world as a result of this trafficking. Uh, uh, trafficking is the nice way to express it. Slavery is the real way uh, to express it. And uh, I learned, you know, the MO of most of the people, especially the sex traffickers, is to induce young women in countries that are uh, down economically, primarily uh, high unemployment, uh, portraying great opportunities, come to Rome and be a model, you're a beautiful woman, uh, I, can, I can be your agent and take care of you, or you, at least you can be a waitress in a nice restaurant and get a wage, you can remit home. And a lot of young people buy this and uh, they get into their, their snare, if you will, and they take away their passport if they have one, uh, turn on them and begin uh, to turn them into a sex slave. And it, it is the, it is, hideously cruel, and it's, it's very, very uh, evident. It, in Rome, uh, in the evening, you could drive around in certain areas in the suburbs of Rome and see 
scantily clad young women standing there, uh, just standing there, you know, evenly spaced. And if you look carefully, if you were sensitive to this, you'd see behind a car parked with its parking lights on. That was the, the trafficker, the handler. And, and we used to say to our Roman friends and point that out, and they used to kind of pat me and say, you know, don't get so exercised about that. That's the oldest profession in the world. And, and I would say, well, yeah, perhaps, but these, these people are, they're not consenting to do this. This is, this is a, a, a new phenomenon in the, in the Western world. And uh, statistics will show, unfortunately, it's also happening uh, in our country as well. It's, uh, it's really become uh, uh, very prevalent in Asia. And uh, so I decided, that, you know, this is something that fits into this mold of wanting to uh, to do something in this in this moral di diplomatic post that I had that, to, to, to begin to push back and, and uh, fulfill these needs for human dignity. So uh, you know, we read up and uh, decided to hold a conference. So in 2002, I put together what was in the largest <laughs> conference ever held in the world, an international trafficking in persons. We had people from 49 countries, over 250 people. The Holy Father did not come, but he sent his foreign minister, which was really uh, significant. He wrote a letter personally for him to read, and it gave us a great base of support with our diplomatic partner there uh, to launch what became uh, a really significant incursion, uh, be it a, a, a microbe, if you will, into this uh, horrific uh, phenomenon that's uh, betaken us in this in this world, which is human trafficking, and it resulted in uh, the development of a. Uh, the UN then got interested because they had representatives there, and they gave us some money. I, I didn't have any money to put on this conference, and the State Department wouldn't give me any money. And ambassadors are not supposed to raise any money except for the celebration of Independence Day on the Fourth of July, but. I figured I could take that story in the front page of the Washington Post, so I raised money anyway. It cost us about 150000 to transport these people and, and to print. Uh, these, this is a book of the proceedings of that, of that conference that we recorded and transcribed. And uh, it, it really set off some, some good things. Uh, there was a nun there who had been a missionary in Nigeria for 19 years, spoke fluent uh, English, and she was the head, uh, head nun of all the orders of nuns in Italy, and there are a lot of nuns in Italy. Once we were in the, in the uh, basilica in Milan, and they, they were honoring all the nuns who'd been nuns for 25 years or more, and that basilica was full. I don't know if you've ever been to Milan, it's a huge basilica. Uh, so she took this on. She, she had an epiphany, if you will, of her ministry, and she is now the lead voice, I'd say, in Europe for trafficking in persons. She's indefatigable, and uh, I think you know she travels with the good grace of, of God, being a saintly woman. Her name is Bonita, uh, Sister Eugenia Bonita, and uh, she helped put together the syllabus for this course that was then taken to four countries and taught to law enforcement officials and church officials. That gave rise to a person on my staff who got uh, so uh, inspired with this, a woman uh, named Amy Roth, that she left uh, the embassy and came back here and went to work for the International Justice Mission, uh, which is a wonderful organization here founded by a trial attorney named Gary Haugen. And they now go out and they make raids, very courageous things that they do. And they've freed over 4,000 victims of, of sex, sex trafficking, sex slavery, and uh, have been the, the mover of over 200 convictions of people with several hundred pending. So we, in effect, uh, you know, have kind of, we're being uh, microcosmic, we have nevertheless gotten some things and I think we've been responsible for the, the freedom, the emancipation of over 4,000 people. And speaking of emancipation, you know, Lincoln in 1862 issued the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing by proclamation the slaves in this country. It wasn't until early 1863 that he actually did the executive order that literally 
uh, freed them, and he said of all of the things that he did uh, in his life, uh, he felt that was the most important thing that he did. And of course, that you know that came uh, over 30 years, well over 30, nearly 50 years after William Wilberforce in England uh, got through the uh, the Slave Trade Act, which ended the, the trading of slaves in the in the uh, British uh, colonies, including the British homeland. That was in uh, 1807. But then it, it continued here until 1863, but it's really it's really continuing on today. And so what I do when I get a chance uh, like this is to speak to people like you about it to try to, one, make you more aware, which maybe you already are, which I was not in the uh, at the end of 2000 and early 2001, but it, uh, unfortunately, uh, the estimates of people who are victims of this continues to go up. And uh, I will say that I'm proud of the United States, uh, and, I, and I feel satisfied because I think we help propel the intensity of the U.S. effort in this field. But I think I think the State Department is now, uh, has elevated this as a priority. They do an annual report. I would have brought it over here, but it's about that thick. And, uh, but you can get it, I think you can get it online. It's a Trafficking in Persons Report, June 2012. And it's very good because it has a history uh, of, of this, uh, this phenomenon. It has a primer. Of, uh, of the MO that I mentioned to you. It, it has steps to take, it, uh, and it has a lot of data, and it ranks all the countries <laughs> in the world about how they are doing in combating trafficking in persons. And some uh, modern countries, you know, first world order countries are not doing very well. Uh, but we in the United States, even though it's present here, I think are, are doing a pretty good job. Uh, in, in trying to lead in this area and manifest that, that admonition about human dignity. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a, uh, a force uh, to be reckoned with, but I am optimistic. I mean, we, we stopped the trading of slaves in, the, in, you know, in the, the British crown, and we stopped it here in this country, and I think we can stop it again. But we people have to get more aware of it, more enraged about it, and then uh, get the policymakers of this country and this world to take more courageous action uh, before we're really, really going to make serious uh, incursions into the, into the reduction of this. And uh, so thank you uh, for having me I'd come over and talk to you about that. And if there's time for any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Nicholson. Excellent presentation. And I'm sure that you've inspired uh, many questions and comments. Uh, who would like to go first? All right, All right we'll start on the front this time. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I'm very happy being at this conference for several reasons, one of which is that yesterday I happened to see somebody who graduated from the same university as myself in Rome. Gregorian University, which is a pontifical university. That's where we held that conference. <laughs> and the second thing now is to see that an ambassador to the Holy See is also participating in this conference here. And I happen to spend some time in Vatican kind of uh, uh, environment, including have a nice picture of Pope John Paul II as altar boy. That's my best picture and souvenir from Rome. Anyway, that's what this about. Um, you mentioned uh, John Paul II, uh, Thatcher, and uh, Reagan, I guess, and their contribution to the collapse of communism. I heard a lot of things about John Paul II's contribution, but I did not know concretely what he did, apart from being uh, from Poland and the collaboration he had with uh, uh, Solidarność, with Bawensa, and all those people. Do you have any? I do. Hassan, can you hear me? I, I have a lot, but it, would, it could be the uh, subject of a, you know, a whole other conference discussion. But the most important thing that he did is that he went back to Poland. He was, he was made pope in, 
in 1978, real dark horse. You know, they've, they've been Italian popes for over 55 years, and they reached out and grabbed this Polish uh, cardinal, Wotia, and uh, made him the pope. And he had grown up first under, uh, you know, the, the, the domination of, uh, of, the, of the Germans in Poland and then the communists. And, uh, and so he had, a, he had a real feeling for it and he had a, a resilience about it and he had a hope, he has an indomitable hope. So a friend of mine wrote a book about it called The Witness to Hope, which is a seminal biography, George Weigel. But he went back, he, he negotiated very cleverly <coughs> for the communists to let him come back to Poland for 10 days in 1979. And he made a tour de force of the, of the country and he, he incited the, the people about freedom. And, and he, he, he didn't do it, you know, he, he was on the, on the border <laughs> with the communists and the Soviets, you know, Russia were saying to their puppets, to their Polish puppets, in Poland, you know, you'd be careful of that guy. <coughs> but nevertheless, he set off uh, a, such a zest for freedom for these oppressed people that it then they began to manifest it in the docks, the workers in the docks and their conditions, and uh, uh, so that, uh, you know, he got something started. And then back to Rome, using our resources, we began to send them really elementary things like telephones and fax machines and different things that could help them communicate with these uprisings and it, it just became an irresistible force with the great moral backing of of course of the Pope and then the United States and, uh, and Prime Minister Thatcher in England and, and you, I mean, you know the rest of the story but the Pope was absolutely central to it. Probably of those three the most most important. All right, who would like to go next, or will we right, we'll continue our way from front to back? Then. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, do you believe the world's inability to combat uh, human trafficking and slavery, excluding the United States, is more of a cultural, as in the sense of the Italian officials you spoke to downplaying the severity, or just an administrative problem? That's a, that's a good question. I, I think it's a, I think it's a combination. Because they, the cultural part of it is that they, they don't see it nearly as seriously as we do. And 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 by the way, I used to go visit these centers that we established in Italy, where we finally if we could get a girl off the street, to bring her into a protective environment, because these people are violent and and, and they, they do things to create deterrence, like kill people. <laughs> so they have to be sequestered. And they're a destroyed human being. I mean, they've, they've been so ravaged physically, but they're, you know, they've lost their dignity, they've lost their self-respect, their damaged goods, they don't have a passport, they don't have an occupation. And, and so they're, to the, the administrative system, they're just a big drag. And that is a dual problem. And part of the answer is, of course, not just to go after the traffickers, but we have to go after the customers. Because that's what keeps it going, uh, are the people who, you know, who buy these, these services. And we, we need to establish that kind of a cultural transformation as well. It's, that's not just a time for a bunch of guys to drink and go out and have a party. I mean, that, that's a very serious thing they're doing. To people who are not consenting as well, and so it's it's a huge mountain out there, but it it's so bad it has to be climbed. And I think you know eventually we will get there. There'll be a tipping point, but we're not there yet. Okay. I'm just curious what the name of the book is. I don't think you stated it. The name of the book you have there. That's oh, that, that book, it. that's, uh, this is not the book. I wrote a book about the uh, history of the Russian. This is just the proceedings <laughs> of that, the first big conference. We ended up having four of them, but it's called Stop Trafficking Human Beings, 
Together, it's possible. And it's, uh, the conference was May 15, 16, 2002. And if you will see me afterwards, I could probably give you the, you know, the publisher. I, I don't know if it's out of publication or not. Mr. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you for the efforts that you made in order to surface these uh, very important subjects uh, of human dignity. But with your background, and with the, what you have done at the uh, end, and if you relate this to the previous conference, that's to say uh, the amount of money that the United States spends in uh, expeditions such as in Afghanistan and in Iraq, trillions of uh, dollars. What you are doing now by saving or by trying to eliminate the uh, human trafficking is like uh, fighting uh, malaria by trying to kill the, uh, the mosquitoes one by one. Whereas uh, if we go one, of course it had to be done, the initiative that you have taken, uh, but if we can go to the source and try to dry the marshes, uh, would you conceive, for instance, a similar effort initiated by you to launch a campaign in the United States or in other countries uh, to allocate a portion of money, a fraction of money, which is used to kill people in, in the wars, to that type of humanitarian or uh, uh, that type of causes uh, pertaining to human dignity, do you think that it, 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 there is more hope of results? Because human trafficking will continue and the sex uh, slavery will continue as long as there is poverty. Yeah. Yeah. So if it could be, something could be done for the source reason, the main reason, then the chances of success perhaps is more sustainable. Do you have any comment to offer well, on this I, question? I, you, uh, you just answered your own question. I mean, you, but the answer that I was <coughs> going to give you is part of this, and it's most prevalent in most of the you know, the, the third world countries that are really struggling economically. I mean, it's, it's sort of similar to our, our immigration problems, say, from Mexico. Uh, you know, they, that has really diminished because the Mexican economy has really improved. And uh, similarly, if, if these people could find more work in their homeland, they wouldn't be so vulnerable to, uh, to what goes on Producing them to make this move, or, or even the, the exporters. So that's that's the core. The core, yeah. Is it feasible? It, it is feasible. It has to be feasible. I mean, it's not going to be instant because it's just too big a, a problem. But, but you know, you think about some of these countries, your country. I mean, ten years ago, Turkey was, you know, on its back. Look at look at. Turkey today relative to Spain. So things can change economically, they can change rapidly, and that changes the equation. But you also have to change uh, the awareness and, the, and the, the mentality of the policy makers about this. But, you know, these movements can gain a, a momentum and a life, and, and then things can really happen. That has not happened in the past. There's not yet a critical mass. See a question? Yes, thank you very much for uh, a very interesting uh, speech. I just have a comment about human trafficking. Uh, human trafficking covers quite a wide range of uh, areas. It's not just trafficking in women or prostitution. It's actually holding any person against the will, his will or her will. 
and that covers all the labor issues. And in fact, what is the problem? In Bahrain, I was in charge in my previous capacity. I was in charge of the uh, ability to combat human trafficking. Where? In Bahrain, okay, my country. Now, uh, the problem is not just the, uh, the issue relates also to countries who actually benefit from this trafficking. So we're talking about governments that are involved because they, they benefit from sending all those workers. Those, yes, those workers, they send them because they retain part of their income or the majority of their income back to their country. So they rely very much. And we're talking about millions. Just in the Gulf, for example, we're talking about millions of people that actually going there and being abused in, in the position there because they are not protected. And it is really difficult to combat because you're fighting an economical, a big economical sort of. Uh, so the only way is to actually is to to talk to these governments and also, in a way, put enough regulations in each country to combat that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I totally agree. Well, thank you again. Oh, wait, one more question in the back. Actually, don't ask. That. I just, I just had a comment, and maybe you might want to comment on it. Uh, as a former soldier, I was just thinking about my first experiences, you know, with the question of prostitution. And I just remember coming out, I was stationed at Fort Littlewood, Missouri, and uh, we had a, we could, at night on the weekend, just go outside the, uh, the gate. And I remember there were, in, in fact, uh, you know, people, you know, you don't, we normally don't talk about these things, but there was a place where the black soldiers went, and it was a place where the white soldiers went. So I remember that very vividly. I, I was thinking about that uh, and my aversion to it and my rejection of it, you know, young soldier, but there were people who, who engaged in that. But my point is this, is that I have, you know, the Denver Post did a study and they called it, uh, they did a series, they called it Betrayal in the Ranks. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I have the PDF here now, and I think people should avail themselves of the opportunity to read that. Betrayal in the Ranks? Betrayal in the Ranks. And it, and it talks about uh, the sexual uh, exploitation of soldiers, uh, of female soldiers and spouses and uh, dependents over a period of time between uh, the early 50s and today, something like almost 50,000 cases of <coughs> sexual abuse inside the military itself. Uh, along with that, my own experience in, in Vietnam of seeing rape on a daily basis. Vang Tao was a place where the United States military had prostitution. Everybody knew it. You could go on R&R, &R, you could go to uh, Bang Bangkok, uh, you could go to the Philippines. If you were a white soldier, you could, go to, you could go to Australia. They didn't want black soldiers there, all right? So there is this um, sort of like f bulwark of support for prostitution in the United States military itself. We have to look this problem squarely in the face. Not to mention, you know, the number of women right here in the capital who stand on the street having to sell their own bodies for any number of reasons, you know, most of them having to do with survival. I'm a filmmaker, and I was in, I'm going to be very brief because my lunch is right over here. <laughs> no, but this is a very serious uh, uh, question. And I was, I'm a filmmaker, and I was filming a scene in Berlin. And um, in fact, I can show it to you. It's amazing. As, as I was um, filming a, a woman who was walking down the street in a music video, I saw a man looking around the corner, and I really didn't figure it out until after I had stopped uh, uh, shooting. You were talking about the person who was ha the handler. And I turned around, and there was this woman looking at me, you know, uh, a very attractive young woman. And she, it, oddly enough, she came up to me, and she smiled. She saw what I was doing, you know, but 
my interpretation of that whole incident was she was looking at me as if, help me, help me. The sad thing was I couldn't do anything at that particular moment, which is a sad statement to make. You know, I hate to make that admission because I should have punched that guy in the face. You understand? You know, so. Uh, I, you know, and I, I often think about going back. I haven't gone back yet, but it's 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 a tragic situation that in this society we have such things as that. But I just wanted to underscore and underline the fact that the United States itself has a serious problem, and our military has, in some ways, you know, a responsibility for it within their own ranks and, and certainly in the countries in which they reside. It's an added, part of it's an attitude problem. I, I certainly agree with you, but that is, that is getting better. Uh, I mean, I entered the military a long time ago. I know about what you talk. It's a lot different now. It's a lot better in the United States. But there, I mean, it, the attitude of, of people has got to be, uh, it's got to be informed and then you know helped shaped and changed because they're. There's, there's no real sense of urgency about this in Europe, believe me. And Europe is full of these, these people that come, you know, from uh, Romania, uh, uh, Albania. I mean, beautiful women who really could be models if, you know, if that was uh, possible. But uh, that's not what they're doing, and it's against their will. Uh, and uh, that's the sex part of it, which is what we, we concentrated on most. But the gentleman from Bahrain is is right. I mean, the State Department has defined trafficked persons, and it's you know anyone that's doing something uh, against their will, they're being coerced to do it. They're not free to stop it, uh, and and that covers a lot of a lot of sins. To me, though, the most horrific human uh, among many egregious conditions is the are the women who are were the sex slaves. Thank you again very much. I enjoyed being with you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary.